My name is Tina Surstad, and I am proud to be a member of the League of Women Voters, Dakota County. It is my honor to introduce our moderator, Lynn Lewis. Lynn is a trained moderator, an active and valuable member of our league, currently serving as co-president and co-chair of Voter Service Committee. Thank you, Lynn. Good evening, and welcome to the SD56B State Representative Candidate Forum presented by the League of Women Voters, Dakota County, and the Dakota County Regional Chamber of Commerce. We extend our heartfelt thanks to the candidate for joining us tonight, and a special appreciation to the City of Apple Valley for recording and broadcasting this event, as well as the City of Rosemount for generously providing these facilities. The recording will be shared with Egan TV to be broadcast to voters in their viewing area. League of Women Voters will also share the recording on our social media platforms. The Dakota County Regional Chamber of Commerce, a cornerstone of our community for 66 years, serves nine cities and three townships, representing half of Dakota County's residents. The chamber is dedicated to advancing both business and community through initiatives like this Canada Forum. We're grateful for their collaboration with the League of Women Voters Dakota County in hosting this event. The League of Women Voters, with a rich 114-year history, is committed to empowering voters through education, engagement, and civic participation. As a nonpartisan organization, the League neither supports nor opposes any political party or candidate. Our goal is to provide unbiased information to Minnesota voters, regardless of their political affiliations. This forum is a valuable public service, offering you the chance to hear directly from the candidates on key issues. Please note that the views expressed are those of the candidate and not of the League of Women Voters or Dakota County Chamber of Commerce. Sponsorship of this event, event does not imply endorsement of any candidate. We provide complete, unedited <coughs> recordings of our forums. Editing is permitted only for official media purposes, and any excerpts or edited clips must not be used for partisan or political purposes. Both candidates were invited to participate in tonight's forum. Candidate Anderson did not respond to our invitation to participate in this forum. Candidate John Hewitt is joining us tonight. We will begin with Candidate Hewitt's opening statement lasting two minutes. The candidate's closing statement will also be two minutes. The candidate will have 90 seconds to answer each question, and we kindly ask that you adhere to the time limits. Our timekeeper will hold up a yellow sign to indicate you have 15 seconds remaining and a stop sign when it's time to wrap up your response. Many of tonight's questions were submitted via email and reviewed by a league committee for clarity. Additional questions were developed based on community interests. Due to time constraints, we'll not be able to address every question that was submitted. Thank you for your participation, and we look forward to an engaging and informative discussion. Let's begin with opening statements. Candidate Hewitt. First of all, thank you. Um, I want to thank the league. Um, I think these, I think these forums are great. Um, it's really important in these times, especially when we see a very close and divided electorate, that we we look at the candidates and know where they stand, so we make informed decisions at the polls. And so I'm really, really uh, thankful to the league uh, of women voters. Um, and also the chamber for sponsoring this event tonight. It's, uh, it, it really is the foundation of us getting the information out and letting the voters make their decision. Real quickly, I wanna talk about the honor I've had over the last six years. Um, I never thought, and my, my dad was a janitor at the, at the uh, Capitol, that a janitor's kid would be sitting in the seat they are today. That is so um, Minnesotan, I guess I can say. And I'm so proud that Rosemount Apple Valley and now Egan has sent me to the house to represent them. And I, I don't look at it as these are John's bills or these are one party's bills. What we've done together is really remarkable. We have really brought back some great deliveries. And I'm hoping tonight the questions that are posed, regardless how difficult they are, I'm going to be able to answer them the best I can and that they talk about the legislation that actually we've acted on in the last six years even. So I'm gonna turn it back over early and we can uh, start the questioning, I hope. Thank you. And our first question is, 
What areas of public policy are you personally passionate about? That's a great question, and it's so obvious. Um, one of the areas that I really worked hard on to begin with was education because I knew that was the value of this area. Um, this area really puts value in its kids and its, in its schools. The investment that this area has put into those programs with kids and schools was humongous and I was able to contribute. And um, we were able to bring back a lot of funds to this area, more than we ever have seen before. And, but that wasn't just John, that was all of us working together. You told me what you wanted, I went and delivered. The other part that it's no secret that I'm big on is emergency medical services. That was my life, that's where I came from. And when I got into the house, I noticed a problem wasn't being taken care of. I cannot believe that parts of Minnesota have a 90 minute response time for an ambulance. No one can live through a situation like that if they're having a heart attack or bleeding out. I put this forth to make sure that we change that, and we did this year. I am excited to say that I and my colleagues and you delivered the first office in the country of emergency medical services that reports directly to the governor. That is truly my passion. I don't want it to be my legacy because it's not really mine, it's all of ours. So I'm sure there's other things we can talk about, but I'm looking forward to the next question. Okay, thank you. And our second question is, What's one piece of recent legislation that you think will most impact your constituents and why do you support it or oppose it? There, uh, the EMS one will definitely impact my constituents. I can't believe how many of my constituents. Um, we, we live in a real good space. We have great services. We have great police. Um, we have some really neat things, and so EMS will impact them. But one that I did this year, which I think is really great, as we, as we see that public safety is brought to the forefront and things that we've done here together, like I was able to secure land for the new police station here in Rosemount, but also in Apple Valley, Egan, and Rosemount, we were able to deliver over a few million dollars to each police station so they can make the changes they need. On top of that, Rosemount, I know, and I believe Apple Valley is one of them, is also gonna experience what we kinda call a LILO program. It's the late entry into law enforcement where a police officer that maybe wants to change a career, not a police officer, but an individual that wants to change a career late in life, like uh, maybe at 35, 40, um, they have a four year or two year degree, they can now go and take just the police classes, which is great. And so with that, we have two officers I know that this chief here in Rosemount has sent to that program, and I'm looking forward to seeing what that does because that will put more public safety on the streets, and that's what we need. Thank you. And for our third question, as a member of the legislature, what measures, if any, would you support to reinforce or ensure voter confidence in our elections? That's a big and great question, and we need to work on that because these last years, a lot of doubt has been cast. And I worked, I was on state government, um, which actually has the elections committee underneath it, and we looked at a lot of these things, at what we can do to tighten this up. Um, Minnesota, really is at the forefront. Everybody says, oh, they don't have paper ballots, they don't do this, these machines. I have to tell you, um, and even people from the other side have come to me and said, I don't know how, how you could cheat here. Um, we have paper ballots, we have a machine that counts, and we have excellent, from both parties, election judges that really give it all, they volunteer, they come in, and when we're talking about fraudulent elections, we're talking about these people, your moms, dads, uncles, aunts that are working at the election polls, and I, I really gotta give it to them. We don't have that many cases in Minnesota that are fraudulent or that are prosecuted. And I don't wanna go into the ones that we did have last year because there were a very small amount of them, but you would be really surprised and heartbroken if I told you who they were because they're not what you're hearing about. Most mistakes at an election poll are made in a mistake. It's made by somebody that didn't know. I believe our election judges are trained. I believe that our Secretary of State stays on top of this. And if not, the other party definitely stays on top of it and keeps it straight. So I, I think we're there. We can always do more. And I look forward to the citizens coming together and working on this. Thank you. And our next question is, the Minnesota legislature passed a law requiring use of electricity from carbon-free sources by 2040. What additional steps should be taken by the legislature regarding climate change? Um, 
the 2040 law, I had, I think it's a real aggressive law, and I hope we can do it. But we don't have the technology today to get there yet, and I know my colleagues and I went back and forth on this. We all have a part of this. We all have to look at, you know, what we're doing to our environment that, that is there that we can, we can change. And if you talk to the, I'm going to screw this up, is, it's a G, what's this next generation? Um, I can't think about it offhand, but it's the one that just is there now. You talk to them and they, they have ideas. And maybe that's where we have to go. This is not, it's not just this, it's that and then some. We're going to probably not be able to get rid of fossil fuels tomorrow. They're going to be here for a while, and we need them here for a while. But like our own plant, Flint Hills, out um, out east of town here, they're doing, they're constantly working on experiments and constantly in the lab of how we can use cleaner burning fuels and what we can do to make that happen. Because let's face it, they don't want to go out of business and they're doing everything they can to prevent that. So I, I take offense that, you know, the oil guys are always the bad guys. They're not. And I think that working together, again, collaboratively, that's what we have to do. Thank you. And our next question is, what should be the legislature's role, if any, in determining school curriculum and what is taught in classrooms throughout the state? That's a great question because I think people give us more credit than we actually have on this one. The legislator's role is where it should be today. We had, number one, we write the check, right? We determine how much is going to be in that formula. That is so important that we stay on top of that and that we monitor that so we don't have waste, fraud, and abuse. But what we need to also do is make sure we trust our local school boards and our parents. Our parents, and I get so frustrated when I hear parents say, I don't have any say. You do. It's called curriculum development nights. And our own district here has them. And I encourage people to take advantage of that. I, I think that the legislators get a lot of credit for what happens up there, and we don't have that. That's not what we're there for. We're not, able, we're not there to say, you have to study this curriculum or this political science platform. We're there to say, you need so many units of this and this and this. And that's what we're there for. The rest should be up to the locals and their parents, their teachers, in the school board curriculum setup. I, I just have a big issue with this. And if you don't believe that's not happening, and I, I want to tell the parents of this district especially, go to a classroom, observe. It's amazing. It's amazing what our teachers are doing. And if you want to change it, get involved. Don't do it from the sidewalk. Get in there, get involved. I, I know the superintendent's going to call me after this, so all right, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And our next question, how would you solicit input from your constituents on issues that come before the legislature? Well, some of my constituents are really good at making sure I hear them, um, if not standing outside the Capitol and making sure they have their signs. So that's good. I like that. Don't, and don't think for one minute I don't appreciate somebody that takes a cold January day out of my area and comes down and holds a sign so I see it clearly and I get their message. That is so important because they, they really want to be heard. Now, we might not agree. But it's important that I am there as their representative and I hear them. Because every time I push a button, it's not the way I'm pushing the button. It's what I was told, what my constituency said, what I heard in data. It's all there. And so I need their input. We try to fish that out. I'm fishing it out as we speak. I have people on the doors tonight talking to constituents that are going to come back with data for me. And that's so important that we knock doors, that we get with technology today. I mean. I had never have done this before, but I'm doing a podcast now, and I'm and welcoming input. I'm also welcoming st stuff up. I, TikTok, I think, is what it's called. So any way I can communicate and any way I can get feedback from them, I want it. I don't care if I agree with it or not, but it gives me a melting pot of where we need to go. And i got to be honest with you, that's what we did in the last election. That's what we're doing this time. We're trying to come up with a way that we're really representing the voice of the constituency and not necessarily the party. Thank you. And moving on to our next question. Due to increases in state government spending in 2023, the budget forecast now shows state spending growth outpacing tax revenue growth. If the state were to encounter a budget deficit, how would you balance the state's budget? 
That's a great question, and I think they called it a, there's a word that they're using for that um, budget. It's not, I, I wish I could come up with the word that they use, and I'm terrible at pulling these words out. Basically, yes, if we stay to a $75 billion budget, the state is going to be upside down. We do not have the tax revenue, and that was because of the surplus, but when we use that surplus dollars for innovation to look at what we want to invest in in the future, that brought the state budget up. But all those programs that we funded, regardless who they were, rural Minnesota, in town here, wherever, all are done in two years. So you're actually done in like a few months here. That's gonna cut off, it's gonna reset to the $56 billion budget that was there before, that is funded. And even with that budget particularly, we see that we're looking good. And if, if that we did have, I, I think you're asking for me, what would I look at if I had to do something? If we had a deficit, naturally we're gonna have to cut. And the best question is where do we cut? But I, this is where we need to get this feedback from constituents. Where can we afford to cut? We can't cut seniors, we can't cut schools, we can't cut public safety. So where do we cut? And that's what I need to know. I had a person come to me recently, cut 2% out of the state budget. And I go, where do you want to cut? You're not hearing me, cut 2% out of the state budget. And I said, where do you want to cut? And then he says, well, I was a hospital administrator and I really need, uh, I need you to give more money to them. So I'm like, I'm lost. Thank you. And our next question, if there continue to be large budget surpluses, do you support lowering all tax rates, lowering tax rates for low and middle income taxpayers <clears throat> only, or not lowering ta tax rates for anyone? Please explain your position. I think if there continues to be surpluses, we have to answer these hard questions. Here in Rosemount, Apple Valley, Egan, we have seniors right now that are being taxed out of their homes because of property values. That's an area I would like to focus on if we continue to have surpluses is definitely in that area. We have middle income, that's pretty much our whole district is a middle income family. We have them individuals really suffering. I mean, yes, we paid for lunches this year and that did give them more money in their pockets, but we need to do more for the middle income people. I would say if we're gonna focus tax cuts, that's where I would like to see them focus. Um, and then we have some companies that I, you know, when somebody's first starting out in a company or somebody's basically struggling along, sometimes they need that oof. So we have a really decent area that we can actually afford to do some tax help or tax cuts or some subsidies. That's what I would like to focus on. And yes, that means lowering the rates, let's see where we can adjust, things like that. But I'm, I'm optimistic. I think that, I, I do think our tax revenues will start going down because of um, I believe inflation is going to start coming down, which means our sales tax will go down. Thank you. And our next question is, many are concerned with gun violence in our communities. What legislation, if any, could you support to meet the need for safe communities? Um, bad night for that one. Uh, we just had a shooting and Minneapolis was a nightmare. And those guns that were used in Minneapolis were not owned by those people. And we try, we try every, every year to do something here. And what are we gonna do? The kid that was involved yesterday was a kid that had access to these through his father. When are people gonna take responsibility for their own guns? When is that going to happen? I'm willing to have that discussion. It's very obvious that all my endorsements, look at them, they're both sides of the aisle. I'm one that reaches across everywhere. If we could do something about this issue, I would love to see what we can do. I'm willing to talk to the strongest gun advocate in the state because we need to figure out a plan. It's not one that I just have. It's one that we all have to bring forward that we can all live with. Because I'm a hunter. I have guns in my house, but everyone is secured. There is no way that people are gonna get to them, I hope. But we gotta end this devastation. Mean, this is just terrible. And we have officers getting killed. We had three tonight uh, that got shot at in Milwaukee. It's gotta end. It's got to end, and I'm sick of politicians saying they'll do something and not doing it. And it's time for all of us to get together on this. And it's not just politicians, it's all of us. Gun owners, non-gun owners, get in the room. Let's get it out. Thank you. And our next question is, what is the role of the Minnesota legislature, if any, on foreign policy issues or events? Um, that's a real hard one for me and it always has been. Um, that's really a federal issue. 
And I think it's important that we listen to what they are and then where we have, I mean, we do have, like right now we're having this USS Steel debate in the, in the limelight and things are really interesting up in the iron range. We want jobs and we're, we do have a number of exports. The agriculture market here in Minnesota is big. And so world events do, do impact us, but they impact us through Washington. And it's up to us to make sure, like the CMS thing has some federal legs in it. I have to go out to Washington and talk to them about this. I would, be, I would do the same thing and work towards how does this, how do we as Minnesota make sure that our soybeans are traded, that our steel is taken from the ground in a good way and that we are able to trade federal, nationally and internationally because I, I was listening to a James J. Hill thing recently and it was unbelievable how we were the, the, the central hub for flour and how he sold it to the Asian market. We can do that again and I think Minnesota can be at the forefront and I don't know how the election is going to go nationally but it would help if we have a guy in Washington that can actually sell this stuff because we have some really great businesses in Minnesota and we really need to pull them forward and that's how we're affected on an international market. Thank you. And our next question is, given the U.S. Supreme Court Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade, state legislatures are enacting new laws regarding women's reproductive health issues, including access to care and birth control. What measures, if any, do you think the Minnesota legislature should enact regarding women's reproductive health and abortion? We did some really good measures this year to protect you, uh, women of the district. We feel that that has to stay in place. We feel that, uh, make it simple, I, I come from a medical background. No one should have a decision of what happens in that exam room except for you and your doctor, as long as the doctor is acting legally and ethically. We can't tell it, we cannot tie a doctor's hands together about what medical things you need that I as a lawmaker that never went to medical school has decided. That's up to you and your doctor. And I don't care if it's a female or a male in that, we are going into that exam room and we have to knock it off. And I will protect everything about that exam room. And that goes for, let's, uh, we haven't touched this, but into life care, all the way from if conception. You are the one that determines who's involved with your health care. I'm the last one. I truly am as a politician and I should not be in there unless my wife or my child decides, well, minors, but unless my adult child decides that I should be involved. And that's as John dad, not John the politician. So I, I will fight for this till the end. I know what my faith is and I know a lot of people question that, but the bottom line is, is this is where my constituents sit. This is what they told me to go to St. Paul on. That's where I have to stay. Thank you. And that brings us to our 12th and final question. Do you support Minnesota's current environmental review and permitting system? Why or why not? And what changes would you recommend? You know, I talked to a lot of the businesses about this and I think it has to be more open. Um, it's not really transparent at all. And that's what I'm hearing from many of the businesses is that you know, you can't move the, you cannot move the goalpost once they meet the standards of where we were to start with. I have a number of businesses in my area that really depend on where those reviews are at. And they, if they meet the standards of where the reviews are at and they did it by the right, what they were supposed to do, and all of a sudden the goalposts were moved because maybe somebody like me put weight on them, that's not right. And those, that can't happen. If we set forth a standard that we expect a company, and we're not talking about my biggest employer, we're talking about the smaller employers around them that actually have this happen. And I wanna make sure that if Minnesota regulators, and I'm gonna just go back with uh, Governor Waltz's first statement when he was elected, not elected, but when he did his uh, inaugural speech, regulators are supposed to partner with businesses, not act like the police were them. They are to go in there and say, this is what we're doing, this is what we need you to do, let's keep it safe together. Thank you. And that brings us to your closing statement. You have two minutes for your closing statement. Again, I wanna thank everybody for um, 
this uh, this town of uh, this forum. I don't want to call it a town hall. I really appreciate the questions. Those were great questions. Um, we've done a lot of good work together over the last six years. It's been really remarkable what we've been able to accomplish. I never, again, the janitor's kid never thought we'd get this far. And I don't think a lot of people ever thought I would get this far. We have brought more of your hard-earned tax dollars from St. Paul back to this district, mainly in the school. You will see projects all over town that I have my footprints on from the police station to the armory, to the new Passover in Apple Valley, to that beautiful treetop trail at the Minnesota Zoo. I, I can't tell you how proud I have been to work on those, but it's only you that has allowed me to do that, and you are the one that say that was a priority. We have a lot more to do. I have to finish my EMS. I have to finish stuff in the district that's going on. We have tier two teachers that need my help right now because they, their laws change for them in the middle of their career that's preventing them from retiring and it would cost them a lot to retire. I wanna go back to St. Paul. I want to be your rep. I wanna make sure that we get to the, I'm, I'm, I'm going pretty soon to a neighborhood that I'm gonna make sure I get there long before they start voting that I'm gonna to have to give bad news to because I'm not gonna be able to help them. But I wanna make sure they have options. So I, I really enjoy working with you. I really enjoy being your rep. I think if you go to my website, hewittforhouse.com, you will see who else supports me. In this time that we have a lot of conflict, I have, I believe it's 40% or 48% of my bills are signed on by Republicans. If you look at my um, endorsements, those are not just Democratic and labor endorsements. They come from everywhere, from police to Republican-leaning organizations. I've done a good job, and I hope that you can see that, and I hope that you send me back to St. Paul. Thank you. And that concludes our candidate forum. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Dakota County, we need to extend our sincere gratitude to everyone who participated in tonight's forum. A special thanks goes to our candidate for his commitment to the democratic process and his willingness to serve our community. The League of Women Voters is dedicated to researching issues critical to our members and the well-being of our communities. If you're interested in learning more about our work and discovering how you can make a difference, please visit us at lwvdakotacounty.org. For additional information about voting and candidates, please check out mnvotes.org and vote411.org. Thank you again for tuning in, and don't forget to vote by November 5th.